Our prayer is it is your desire that you would place your hands or yourself in the hands of God, the hands of the potter, and let him take us and mold us and make us and fill us and do with us what he needs to throughout 2018. And that is part of the reason we are beginning our 21-day Daniel fast, along with an emphasis on prayer over the next several weeks, and to help us have a better understanding of why we fast and why we pray and why we do this, I want to spend some time talking about fasting and prayer this morning. Many of you here have been a part of a 21-day Daniel fast with us, and so it's really not new to you. And then there are some of you who maybe have never uh, done a fast or never done a Daniel fast, and it's kind of uh, you're wondering what you do and how you do and why you do. And so this is what we're really going to be talking about uh, this morning as we talk about fasting and prayer. We read in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 18 and 20. Mark writes the following words. Now John's disciples, speaking about John the Baptist. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guest of the bridegroom, the, that word bridegroom is a title that was given to Jesus by John in John chapter 3 verse 29. John calls Jesus the bridegroom. So Jesus says, how can the bridegroom fast how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? And then he answers the question. They cannot so long as they have him with them. And he was talking about in reference to a Jewish wedding feast. It was a great time of dancing and happiness, and there was a lot of eating going on, a lot of celebration going on. Unlike our wedding that we have today in our culture, a Jewish wedding feast and festival went on for days and days and days. Lots of eating, lots of joy, lots of dancing, lots of celebrating going on during that time. So Jesus is referencing this uh, Jewish wedding about himself. And he says, they cannot fast as long as they have him, the bridegroom or the groom, with them. But then he says this, there will come a time when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. There will come a time when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. What's he talking about? He's talking about his ultimate death and ascension into heaven. And he says, then on that day they will fast. Jesus knew that there would come a time when he would no longer be physically present with his disciples or with the church. And when that time came, when he was no longer physically on the earth with his disciples or with the church, he knew they would need a supernatural strength. And so he says, then they will fast. When I'm no longer with them, then they will fast. It must have been amazing to have walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and eaten a meal with Jesus and anything else you can think of. It just must have been amazing. And whenever there was a problem that the disciples could not handle, they could always go to Jesus because he was physically present with them on the earth. They handled lots of problems. They did lots of things so that on their own, but there were some things that they just could not handle within themselves. And Jesus said, when I am no longer here, when the bridegroom is gone, then they will fast because they will need to fast to receive supernatural strength and supernatural power. I believe that on January the 7th, 2018, we are living in those days that Jesus was talking about. Jesus is no longer physically with us. But I think that many of us would agree in our culture that our need for supernatural spiritual power is very great. So how do we obtain this power? 
How do we get what we need? Well, the Bible tells us there's only one way to obtain this power, and that is through prayer and fasting. So today, the Harvest Ministry Church is joining together in a 21-day corporate Daniel fast. A Daniel fast is nothing more than a partial fast. And we will fast until January the 28th, and we'll break our fast together that morning with communion after following the sermon that morning. We've been talking about this fast for weeks. Last week, many of you signed a fasting contract. I have many of them here with me this morning that said, I'm going to commit to this fast. You wrote down prayer needs that you had that you want to pray about while you're fasting. Uh, you wrote down someone who's going to fast with you during this time. If you were not here last week, if you didn't sign a contract, they're on the back table. If you would fill one of those out before you leave and just give it to me or one of the staff members, that would be great. We're going to take these, and every day for the next 21 days, we will pray over all of these requests in our office building and pray that God blesses and touches and moves in your life in a very special way. There's no power in that fast contract. They're not binding or anything like that, but there's something about writing your name down on a piece of paper that says, I'm going to commit to this. And it just gives a little extra push to keep you on track throughout the next 21 days. So I hope you will do that. I also hope you have spent the last week eating your Christmas leftovers and New Year's leftovers, cleaning out the cabinets. Uh, I can't tell you how much candy I ate last night about 10.30. Uh, I bought this huge piece of candy on a trip last week, and I said, there's no way that's going in the garbage tomorrow. It's going to my belly tonight. And so my belly is full of chocolate and almonds and all kinds of things right now. I was not wasting. I told y'all to clean out your cabinets. So I hope you did that. And I hope you went shopping and bought all the foods you needed to get everything ready for the Daniel fast that we're about to embark on. I told you last week that the Daniel fast comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been taken into Babylonian captivity uh, in, in a takeover, and uh, they received permission to not eat the food from the king's table, who, who would have the best food in the kingdom would be the king, and they decided to eat nothing but vegetables and drink water for 10 days. And the Bible tells us after that 10-day period that Daniel and his friends were healthier, they were stronger, they had a better countenance, they looked better than anybody who had been eating from the king's table and eating the king's food. And so basically what we're doing in our Daniel fast is we are taking away some common foods that we would normally like to eat on a day-to-day -day basis, and we're just replacing those with more pure foods that will help us feel better and look better and all those other things we hope will happen throughout this fast. All that information is on the back table back there for you. We have recipes back there. There's a website on the screen, ultimatedanielfast.com. has some great recipes, some great ideas. You know, so Pastor, I, I don't have time to prepare meals and line everything up. If you own a crock pot, there are hundreds and hundreds of Daniel Fast approved crock pot recipes out there. Put it on in the morning, set it, and as they say, set it and forget it. Come home and eat your Daniel meal that night. And so there's all kinds of ways and tools to help you as you go throughout this fast time. As we always say, if you have a legitimate health reason that would prevent you from fasting, we want you to use wisdom during this uh, next 21 days, and maybe there's something else you can give up, some type of technology, or maybe there's a specific food you like to eat that you use, so I can give that up during this time. But we know that every time a fast is taken in the Bible, that miracles happen and blessings happen and spiritual growth happens and breakthroughs happen. We know that the power of God is ushered in during that time of fasting in our individual lives as well as in the life of our congregation. So we believe that that will all happen as we go throughout our time and as we fast. We see a powerful picture of prayer and fasting in a passage of Scripture found in the book of Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, Jesus has taken his, uh, what we would probably call his closest disciples with him. 
He had a core group. He had his 12, and then that 12 kind of narrowed down to three. And we say this repeatedly. You need to have some really close friends around you. It's great to have lots of friends, and we all want to have lots of friends. And it's amazing, this Facebook culture that we live in and dwell in now. You may have 785 friends on Facebook, and you don't know 785 people in your life, but yet they're your friends. But they're really not your friends. They're just people you know, and they're kind of on the fringes of life and you kind of know who they are and a little bit about them. But all of us see some really close people to us, so we can kind of narrow this down. Jesus had three really close people out of all the 12 disciples that he depended on and counted on and really leaned into them as well. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 17, they took Peter, James, and John to a mountain. And while they were on the mountain, he was transfigured, a word we don't use very much anymore in our, in our conversation mostly. But Matthew was not there on the mountain with Peter, James, and John and Jesus. So he heard this story from them secondhand or firsthand, secondhand, I suppose, and he just wrote down what they told him. Here's what he said. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, Peter, James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. Now, what happened when he was transfigured? Well, Matthew tells us, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine being there, and all of a sudden, Jesus' face begins to light up like the sun, and his clothes begin to begin as bright as the light? Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you, have, what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. What a powerful story. What a powerful event in the life of Peter, James, and John. To see the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. To see Elijah and Moses come and talk with Jesus. And what a wonderful time and sight that must have been. And as they come off of the mountain, they were met by the rest of the disciples and a large crowd of people, the Bible says, who had been following Jesus because they wanted to see what kinds of miracles he would perform next in their lives. And there were two specific things I want to talk about this morning that were waiting for Jesus as he came off of the mountain. The first thing waiting for Jesus was a need. There was a father who had a son who brought his son to the disciples of Jesus while Jesus, Peter, James, and John were on the mountain, hoping that the disciples of Jesus had cured this boy of his sickness. Basically, he was epileptic, and he would often have seizures. And he would often, the Bible says, would fall into fires, and he would often fall into water. And his father wanted someone who could help his son get better from this sickness and this disease that he was dealing with. But the disciples could not help this boy, and they could not meet his need. In fact, it was beyond their ability, it was beyond their spiritual ability, and it was beyond their human ability, and no matter what they attempted or what they tried that day, they were unable to deal with this situation. For many of us here this morning, and those watching online, perhaps you have served the Lord for quite a while. And you have found yourself in a situation from time to time where you have tried with everything inside of you to find an answer for a need in your life or the need in the life of a friend or a loved one. You tried everything that you could think of to meet that need. You felt like you have exhausted all of your spiritual resources and yet the need is still unmet. Maybe that sickness still remains, or that situation is still unchanged, or that person is still unsaved. So what do you do when you find yourself in that situation? Jesus came down from the mountain where he and his closest disciples had been in the very presence of God. 
And how many know that when you're in the very presence of God that everything seems perfect and the possibilities seem unlimited when you're in the presence of God? You've been in those moments, haven't you, where you have felt like you were in the very presence of God as you could just reach out and touch God and it felt like perfect peace in that moment and in that situation and it felt like you could do anything because you found yourself in the presence of God. And Jesus and his disciples come down from the mountain where they have been in the presence of God. He has been transfigured. His face lights up like the sun. His clothes begin to shine like a bright light. They see Moses and Elijah, this wonderful, moving, spiritual experience. And then as they come off the mountain, they find themselves back in the grim reality of life, faced with a need. How many times have you been in a powerful church service or experienced the touch of God in a special way that you felt like in that very moment I could tackle every demon in hell right now in this service? Bring it on, devil. I can take you right now. And yet at some point you realize you have to leave that place or leave that service and you have to go back into what we call the real world with all of its reality and all of its mess and all of its confusion, and you find yourself often confronted with a problem or a situation or a person that you've been praying for. And that thing that you've been praying for, that person that you've been praying for, hasn't changed at all, it seems like. And it's almost as though you feel like when you leave that great spiritual service where you can tackle every demon in hell, when you step back into the reality of life, it's almost like the wind is sucked right out of your sails. And you find yourself back in the same mess, in the same situation that you were before you got into that spiritual high. But I thank God this morning that Jesus is the master of all needs. And if you have a situation in your life today that you don't have an answer for, if you have a need that you've been praying for, if you have a family member who was unsaved this morning, if you are facing an impossible situation today, I declare to you on the authority of the word of God that your hope is in Jesus Christ and nothing is too hard for him. If you are sick this morning, I believe before you leave this building, you can be healed in Jesus' name. If you are discouraged, I believe you can leave encouraged today in Jesus' name. If you don't know the answer to the problem, I believe before you walk out of these doors that you can have an answer for that problem in Jesus' name. Why? Because the word of God tells me Jesus can do all things. He can still do it today for you in your life. Nothing is too hard for him. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 17 and 18. Jesus, when faced with this problem, faced with this young boy, rebuked the demon, and it came out of this boy, and he was healed at that moment. What does Jesus do at that very moment? In an instant, Jesus turns this boy's life around. He changes the situation. He takes what was once impossible and accomplishes the impossible. How many have ever had Jesus turn your life around and do the impossible for you and take what everybody said couldn't be done and he made it happen anyway? He still does that today in our lives. Don't believe the naysayers. Don't believe the doubters. Don't surround yourself with people who don't believe that God can do all things. Don't surround yourself with friends who don't believe that God still does miracles and God still heals. Surround yourself with like-minded people who believe like you believe that nothing is impossible with my God. Amen. He can do all things. What is it you're saying, Pastor? I can, well, you may need to clean your friend list out and just get some good people around you. And hey, I like you, and you're a good person, and you're kind and all of that, but I need somebody who can help build my faith up and encourage me and give me a boost when I need a boost and help me keep on going. I don't need naysayers and, and people who say God can't do it and God won't do it, and maybe God will. Yes, God can do it if I believe he can do it. His word tells me that. And so Jesus changes this boy's life forever. And so he is faced with a need when he comes off the mountain. The second thing he is faced with 
is the question. And here's the question from his disciples. Why couldn't we cast out that demon? That's the question. Here's the need. A boy is sick. We would say a, a demon of sickness, a demon of illness. Why couldn't we cast out that demon? Why couldn't we help this boy? No doubt the disciples have prayed for people in the past and those prayers have been answered. I don't have any doubt about that. There is no doubt that they had ministered effectively in their past. But what was different this time? Why couldn't they cast out this demon? And I can almost imagine the conversation with Jesus now, I was raised in Pentecostal church, so my conversation that I hear in my mind is a Pentecostal conversation, okay? If you're raised in a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, then that may be the conversation you hear in your mind. But mine is a Pentecostal conversation going on when they talk to Jesus. So just bear with me in this point. But I can imagine them saying to Jesus, Lord, we tried everything we knew to try. We prayed exactly like you pray. I mean, it's ever been in a Pentecostal altar call before, and the person beside you prays loud and loud and loud, and pretty soon their prayer gets in your mind, and you start praying the same thing they're praying. You don't mean to do it. It just happens. It just kind of jumps off on you, and you're just praying the same prayer they're praying. And I can hear those comments, Lord, we prayed the same prayer that we heard you pray. And then my Pentecostal mindset kicks in, and they say, Lord, we got louder and louder and louder. Because we all know in the Pentecostal tradition, the louder you pray, the better it is, right? You, if it's not working now, just take it up an octave. It's bound to get better if you pray louder. Lord, we pray louder, louder, and even more loud. Still didn't happen. Lord, we took our hands and put them on this boy. Another Pentecostal tradition. And we shook him from side to side. Because if praying what you pray doesn't work and yelling louder doesn't work, surely we'll shake this thing out of this boy. How many's ever had a God bless some good hearted Pentecostal person shake it out of you or try to shake it out of you before? If not, we can sign you up for that. We'd be glad to shake you from time to time. That's just our Pentecostal tradition. But nothing happened. No matter how loud we prayed, no matter what we prayed, no matter whether we shook him or didn't shake him, nothing happened. God, what went wrong with us when this happened, Lord? I don't know about you, but I've been in that place before. In fact, I've been there many times in my lifetime, and even as a pastor. And I'll have questioned God and asked God, why? Why didn't it work? Why didn't my prayer work? Why didn't our prayer work? Why didn't it work when we anointed and laid hands on? We shook and we got loud. Why didn't any of that work, Lord? And there's many questions I've, I've, I've had over the years. I know I'll probably have more throughout my lifetime. And then Jesus answers their question, probably in a way that they were not really expecting him to answer this question. In Matthew 17 and 20, he kind of begins to preface this answer, and he tells them that they need a little bit of faith, just a little bit of faith. In fact, he says you need faith the size of a mustard seed. And then in verse 21, he tells them, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And it's probably not the answer they were looking for or the answer they were expecting, but that's the answer Jesus gave them. Now, depending on your translation, some manuscripts don't put this verse in. They make a footnote of it. Some translations, and probably the more accurate translation, Jesus would have probably actually said, however, this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. But nonetheless, the message is still the same, that prayer and fasting is important to the question they were asking. I have told you this many times over the years regarding prayer and fasting, but I think it's important to repeat it again this morning. Prayer connects me to God. Fasting disconnects me from the world. Prayer connects me to God. Fasting disconnects me from God, from the world. 
My wife read something to me this week, and she said, fasting without prayer is nothing more than a diet. I thought that was good. Fasting without prayer is nothing more than a diet. Prayer connects me to God. Fasting disconnects me from the world. There are some things that you will pray a prayer of faith over and a miracle will happen just by you praying that prayer of faith. The prayer will be answered. That need will be met. That situation will be turned around. But there are some needs that are especially great that you will face in your lifetime. There are some obstacles that have a whole different dimension of difficulty about them. There are some things that requires a specific breakthrough in the heavenly realm. There are spiritual problems that are spiritually discerned and they require spiritual power to break them. Now, I, I know a lot of folks don't like to talk about demons and the powers of darkness and all of those things. And some people believe in that. Some people don't believe in it. And whether you accept that or not, I believe and we believe that there are demonic powers at work all around us. It is not the stuff of make-believe. It is not the stuff you see in movies. But it is, as Paul said in Ephesians 6 and 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. As Paul is saying, there are demonic forces around us that are active, that are moving, that are working, that are trying to disrupt, that are trying to cause bad things to happen. They're all around us. And Paul says, listen, our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's not, that's not it. This is not, a, this is not where the battle is. The battle is with these spiritual forces. Can I just say this? If the devil can get you and I fighting with each other all the time and mad at each other all the time and criticizing each other all the time and tearing each other down all the time, we are forgetting about the spiritual forces that are out there and we're focused only on here and we're not praying against those forces and we're not fighting against those forces and those forces are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It is time for the body of Christ to stop fighting with each other, to realize our struggle is not with you and me, but our struggle is those spiritual powers and wicked powers and high places and in heavenly realms. That's where our battle is today. You're not my enemy and I'm not your enemy. The enemy is the one who wants to take our soul and drag it to hell with him. That is our enemy. In the book of Daniel chapter 10, one of my favorite passages of scripture, I preached it hundreds of times. We read about Daniel fasting for three weeks about a situation. He was doing a Daniel fast, which, which we're gonna be doing in Daniel chapter 10. And during that time, a man suddenly appeared to Daniel. And Daniel describes how this man looked. He said he was dressed in linen. He had a belt made of the finest gold around his waist. He says his eyes were like lightning and flames of torches. His arms and legs were like bronze, and his voice was like the sound of a great multitude. And he told Daniel that God has heard your prayers, and he has seen your fasting. And then he tells him this in verse 13 of Daniel 10. But the prince of Persia resisted me 21 days. Who is the prince of Persia? He is a high-ranking demon who has resisted me for 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the chief angels, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. This is a clear example that there are demonic forces around us all the time. And so while Daniel was praying and fasting, this high-ranking demon, the prince of Persia, was fighting and withholding the angel who was coming to give Daniel the answer that he was praying about until Michael was released to go fight against that other high-ranking demon, which freed up the angel to come and speak to Daniel. 
Now, you can believe that or not believe that. That's totally up to you this morning. I just happen to believe what the Word of God tells me. I'm not a fool. I'm not ignorant. I'm not uneducated. But I believe the Word of God, what it says, that's what it means, and it happened exactly like that. That's what I believe. There are demonic forces around us. And you may be praying for an answer for something in your life. It could be a sickness. It could be a relational problem. It could be a financial problem. It could be a spiritual problem. And when you are praying and fasting, I believe that demonic forces are unleashed against us to try to hinder what God wants to do. But I also believe that God is still on the throne and God still has all power and he can unleash his power for angels to come and fight the battle for us so the answer comes right on time. Amen. Still believe that today. We often struggle with what is going on around us in the heavenly realm. But Daniel 10 shows us that prayer and fasting can affect the outcome. Nowhere in the word of God are we told to be afraid. Nowhere are we told to run and hide. Nowhere are we ever told in the word of God that we cannot be an overcomer. Jesus tells us very plainly and clearly that we need to seek the spiritual power to break through in these areas, and it comes by prayer and fasting. Prayer combined with fasting releases a spiritual power in your life. And how do we know this? Well, Jesus knew what he was talking about because he had gone to the wilderness and prayed and fasted for 40 days. Now, when Jesus prayed and fasted, he did a complete fast. He didn't eat or drink anything for 40 days. He did a complete fast. No food, no water. And Luke says, after a time of prayer and fasting, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. What had he done? He had disconnected himself from the world, and now he's in the power of the Spirit. Jesus knew the value of prayer and fasting. It is clear that he had been fasting and praying prior to the incident with the boy with epilepsy. He was ready for every occasion of his life because he prayed and he fasted. Some of you have been dealing with an issue or problem or a situation or a sickness for months or maybe even years. Can I just tell you that crying over your situation will not give you the breakthrough that you need. You cannot sing yourself into a breakthrough. Talking to the pastor will not give you the breakthrough that you need in your life. Reading books on the subject about how to get a breakthrough will not give you the breakthrough. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Amen. Prayer and fasting. You know how some folks don't want to hear about this? It's because prayer and fasting are spiritual disciplines. And we are very undisciplined people. Very undisciplined I told you last Sunday morning that by February 1, most everyone in this room will have broken their New Year's resolutions or goals they set for themselves. We are very undisciplined. Prayer is a discipline and fasting is a discipline. But as we read about prayer and fasting, they show up in every nook and cranny of the Word of God. They show up all throughout church history. And let me tell you, that God tends to show up in his glory and his power whenever and wherever his people set themselves to prayer and fasting before him. In the book of Esther, chapter 4, we receive that Queen Esther and all of Israel fasted for three days and God showed up. In the book of Luke, chapter 2, we read about an 84-year-old woman named Anna who lived in the temple and prayed and fasted night and day. And when they brought Jesus to the temple, she recognized him as the Messiah because she had prayed and fasted. In the book of Acts chapter 10, we read about Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, part of the Roman military, who fasted for four days and was visited by an angel. The angel told him to go send for Peter, the apostle, to come and preach to them. And because of prayer and fasting, Cornelius, the Roman military man, became the first Gentile, non-Jewish convert to Christianity recorded in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Because he prayed and he fasted, things happened. We also know that Jesus fasted, Moses fasted, and Elijah all fasted for 40 days doing complete fast. There are many other examples in the Bible that we won't talk about this morning. 
But fasting seems to show up when ordinary people just like me and just like you need extraordinary power and provision to overcome impossible odds, to overcome the enemy of our soul and to overcome obstructions. Historically, in the church, revival breaks out when people seek God through prayer and fasting. We're not fasting to earn something from God. When we are fasting to make a supernatural connection to God. I'm not trying to get something from God by fasting. I'm not trying to gain something for myself, but I'm trying to connect to God during this time of prayer and during this time of fasting. So I want to ask you this morning, if you're ready to unleash the power of God in your life, Amen. are you ready to receive some fresh anointing in your life this morning? Yeah. Is there a stronghold in your life that needs to be broken today? Is there a miracle that you need to receive in your life this morning? Is there a habit that you're trying to break that you can't seem to do it within yourself? You struggle with it for years, but you believe that through the power of prayer and fasting, that habit can be broken. I believe it can happen for you if we'll pray and we'll fast. I understand and realize this morning that not everyone here will participate in the set, the 21-day Daniel fast, but I hope that you will seriously consider joining us on this journey. I believe it will make a difference in your life if you will commit to it. In just a moment, we're going to receive communion as a church family. If you're joining us on a 21-day Daniel fast, or you're not joining us on a 21-day Daniel fast, we still want you to join us in communion this morning. If you haven't filled out a fasting contract, we want you to fill out one of those fasting contracts. But we believe that powerful miracles are going to take place over the next 21-day period. We believe that. And here's what else I believe this morning. I believe that you can receive a miracle as you receive communion today. Hallelujah. I believe that. I believe if you're sick in your body, you can receive a healing this morning just like that. I believe that. But it's not enough for me to believe it. You have to believe that. You have to expect that. I believe you can receive an answer to a prayer this morning as you receive communion into your body. I believe some of you have been praying for an answer, and there has been an angel, demon fighting against you, but I believe as you receive communion today that the Lord can release that spiritual angel to come and fight that demonic demon away from you and give you the answer that you need. But you've got to believe that this morning. And I can tell you this, the devil doesn't like this. He's not happy about this. He's going to fight you on every hand. He's going to try to get you to give up. He's going to tell you it's too hard. He's going to tell you you can't stick to that Daniel fast. He's going to tell you you can't go without your coffee, and you've got to have that Coca-Cola, and you've got to eat a candy bar like I had to eat a candy bar last night, and you can't go without French fries and pizza. You can't go without any of that stuff. And you tell him right to his face, devil, you are a liar. You are a liar. Can I promise you this? You will not starve to death over the next 21 days. There's enough meat on most of our bones that will sustain us for longer than 21 days. You will not starve to death. I promise you that. But the enemy will come against you and tell you you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. And can I just give you a word of encouragement? If you fall off the wagon, just pick yourself up and get right back on the wagon again. Just get on it again. If you mess up, it's okay. God's not going to strike you dead. We're not going to say anything to you. We're just going to encourage you and love you and cheer you on so you can do this, you can do this. And if you mess up, that's okay. Just start all over again and keep on going with it. That's all you have to do. Now, why do we receive communion? Well, we receive communion to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. We believe he went to the cross, was beaten for us, was spat upon for us, was tortured for us so that we could have eternal life. Through his blood, we are saved. 
through his body being broken and beaten, he says, by my stripes, you are healed. Healing, salvation, atonement, eternal life, all of that is made possible because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for us. And so we want to remember that today. It's a very sacred thing to remember. It's very personal to remember. Because all of you here this morning who are saved can remember the moment you accepted Jesus Christ into your life. And you're just thanking him for that today. But at the same time, if you need an answer to a prayer, or you need a healing in your body, you just tell the Lord, I receive my healing today through this act of communion. I receive it in my body this morning. And I believe you can leave here healed and whole. And so I'm going to ask those who are going to assist us to make their way to the table. And as they're doing that, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me if you would. We want to have a time of prayer. The Bible teaches us that we should search ourselves before we receive communion. Just to make sure everything is okay between God and us. There's no hindrances there. There's nothing that shouldn't be there. And this is a perfect time to search your life and ask forgiveness if you need to for anything that's in your heart that maybe shouldn't be there. Maybe if you're a little bit off track with the Lord this morning, you're just going to get right back on track now before you receive his communion. And as we pray, I just want you to pray for yourself and search your heart today. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for sending your only son that we could have the hope of eternal life. Lord, there's not one of us in this room or anyone watching us right now who is perfect. The scripture tells us we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have, Lord. But you love us anyway, and you care about us anyway. And you don't discard us, and you don't throw us out, but you just keep on loving us. Search us today, Lord. If there's anything in our hearts, anything in our minds that shouldn't be there, anything that would hinder us from receiving communion today, we ask you to forgive us of that this morning. Put us in the right relationship with you. Lord, if there's someone who doesn't know you yet that's listening or watching, I pray that they would just ask you to come into their life today to be their Savior, to accept what you did on the cross for them and change their life forever. Father, I pray for those who are embarking on the 21-day fasting journey with us, that you'll give them a special grace, a special strength and encouragement as they make this commitment, that as they pray, they will connect to you, and as they fast, they will disconnect from the world. Help us, Lord, to live our lives that way with prayer and fasting. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could you just take a moment and just rejoice in the Lord this morning? Our servers are taking communion to those who are working and doing some other things around the building right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you need healing, would you just begin to pray that prayer to receive healing this morning? Wherever it is in your body, whatever's wrong, whatever's going on, you receive that healing. You receive it today. If you're waiting for an answer to a prayer, you just begin to receive that prayer, that answer this morning. God, I receive that answer this morning in my life. I receive it even now as we're here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for answering prayer this morning. Thank you for already healing bodies this morning. Thank you for restoring. Thank you for answers, Lord, today that are coming. They're on the way. Thank you, Lord. Father, again, we come before you, thanking you for all that you've done for us today. 
Thank you that we could come into your house this morning. Sense your spirit and sense your presence in a special way. Thank you again for those who are making this commitment this morning to join us on the Daniel Fast journey. Those who can't participate, Lord, whatever they're choosing to do to draw closer to you, just bless them in that journey as well. Give us strength and give us encouragement. And again, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for coming and living among us, walking among us. Thank you for taking off your glory and laying it aside and putting on this fleshly body so that you would know what it's like to be us. You know our weaknesses. You know our struggles. You know our temptations. And yet, you were without sin and without blame. You were perfect. Thank you for that, Lord, that you are the perfect Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Thank you for taking a beating for us that by your stripes we might be healed. And thank you for those in this room today and those watching us right now who have testimony after testimony of your healing power in their bodies. Thank you for that, Lord. We love you, and we ask your blessing upon everyone here and everyone watching as we go into this new week. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you this morning. I want you to leave here and eat the biggest, baddest, worst thing you can think of before you start your fast, all right? God bless you. It's going to be a great 21 days, I guarantee you, in Jesus' name. Amen.